Welcome to Being Human. Delighted to say my host this week is Professor Michael Wade, the author of two books, Digital Vortex and his latest book, which I'm lucky enough to have a pre-read of, Orchestrating Transformation, How to Deliver Winning Performance with a Connected Approach to Change. You're a professor at IMD and you run a, a research group within IMD specifically looking at digital change, digital disruption. Uh, does that sound about right? Yeah, you got it right on, right on. Thank you. So thank you, Michael, so much for your time uh, coming from Switzerland today. Uh, now, I've read the book and uh, I, I must say I, I, I loved it. You know, I think it had such a broad sweep and it was a, a different way at looking at transformation holistically um, that seemed to uh, acknowledge the complexity in a way that perhaps the other broader change frameworks, at least in my mind, don't do. And we've had a couple of complexity scientists on the show, um, so I'll be very interested to, to get into that as we go into it. Um, early on in the book, you talk, you talk about the nature of interdependence between um, resources and um, parts of an organization and how that the level of interdependence, interdependence can determine the change approach or the transformation approach you want to take. Do you want to start a bit there in terms of what these different types of independence, interdependence are? Yeah, sure. You, you know, we've been uh, working with companies for a number of years now on this topic of, of, of transformation in general and digital transformation in particular. And, you know, there's quite a few frameworks out, out there. You know, our first book, we, we, we talked about strategy and, you know, how to approach dealing with uh, challenges of disruption, understanding how disruptors disrupt and, 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 and so forth. And, and if we're not careful, that can all, all get a little bit conceptual. So you can have a conceptual idea of, of how you should approach these, these challenges, um, but then you actually have to do it. And, and this, is, this is, I think, really where most companies are struggling today. Because they, they take this very nice framework uh, uh, and way of thinking, and they, then they go into the organization, and, and, and what, they, what they meet is just a wall of complexity. I think companies today are just more complex than they ever have been uh, in, in the past. And when we really dug into this complexity, we realized it's, it's, it's composed of three general parts. Um, uh, and, and the first part is, is, is just the number of things that need to be managed today, the number of, the scale, uh, uh, the volume and variety of things that just need to be managed, you know, projects, processes, systems, products, people. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be managed. Uh, the second element is, is what you just mentioned now, which is interdependence. And so all those things that are, that are increasing in size, you know, they're all linked together. And Often they're linked in ways that are not particularly clear or obvious. So just understanding the interdependence, the linkage among those things is, is, is really, really tough. And then the third uh, element of complexity is, is dynamism. So there's a lot of stuff. It's, it's uh, connected in ways that are hard to understand and predict, and it's dynamic. So they're all changing over time in ways that are difficult to understand. You know, it's not linear change uh, uh, anymore. It's, it's fast and unpredictable change. So you have these nice plans that you put together uh, to transform, and then you just hit this wall of complexity and it all goes out the window. Uh, so what we tried to do with this book, Richard, is to unpack some of that complexity, kind of cut through it so that your, your great plans that you put together have a fighting chance of succeeding. Okay, so you still see some value in plans, then? <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> of course, uh, of course, planning is important. Uh, probably less important than it's ever been, uh, to be honest with you. I think the idea of the the three year plan. I bet many of your listeners uh, uh, have three year plans, or somewhere in that planning cycle, some of them will have five year plans. And and those could be kind of valuable to give you direction, but but they can also lock you in. They can also be anchors that kind of uh, keep you on a certain path, which is fine in a stable world, but in a world that's constantly changing, those plans can actually uh, cause you to, to, to deviate away from where, where you really should be. 
So what we talk about, you know, in in the, in this book is is really that the planning has probably never been less important than it is today. But at the same time, uh, vision and agility have never been more important. So it's extremely important to be agile, to be able to shift as, as, as situations change, environments change. That's extremely important. But without a clear vision, that change can just kind of uh, make you go around in circles. So clear vision, but not knowing how to get there is fine. And, and honestly speaking, Richard, that, that, that's a hard thing to take for a lot of companies that are really built around this idea of planning and milestones and budgets and all that infrastructure that goes around the plan. So yeah, planning is, there's still a role for planning, but I think it's probably less important and less critical now than it's ever been. Okay, so what does that planning look like? You know, what, what is the effective amount of planning or nature of planning? What does that look like? Well, it depends a lot on the industry. So, so you know, some some industries with relatively high clock speeds, you know, the the, the visibility into the future for which you plan for is 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 maybe six months, maybe nine months, uh, but probably not too much longer than that. And there needs to be a willingness and an understanding. And there's a big cultural element to this that maybe we'll talk about later. That 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 shifting um, direction is is okay. Now, if you're in a very you know, uh, um, uh, asset intensive industry that requires, you know, a, a, a big budgets, you know, capital projects that take years to deliver. I mean, th- then of course the planning cycle is going to be a little bit longer, but the idea of, of being open to shifting, uh, plans and keeping optionality open as long as possible is still valid, even in those kind of, you know, highly asset intensive industries. For example, we're, we're doing a lot of work these days in uh, in the oil and gas sector, which of course has very very long planning horizons, and yet, you know, uh, uh, more agile approaches are, are still valid even even there. Yeah, and in the book, we use the example of a, a, a chief digital officer in an oil and gas firm, kind of not knowing what the hell that that meant, right, in a, in a traditional industry like that. Yeah, that's, that's true. I I mean, that's, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I suppose that what we're seeing now is that all industries to some level are, are needing to embrace this, this digital shift. That's true. You know, when we first started really seriously looking into this about four years ago, we'd, we'd have lots of lots of companies coming to us uh, for for training. And uh, they would be from the industries that you would expect with seeing a huge amount of digital disruption. So media companies, retailers, technology companies. And so forth, but today um, it's 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 a complete cross section of industries are interested in this topic. Uh, as much, you know, the uh, the, the sort of B two B traditionally not very digital type industries as much uh, we we see we see them as as we do the more nimble, you know, uh, e commerce type type organizations. Everybody seems to be interested in this topic today, and nobody really has a clear answer of what to do. Right, and and in the book you develop this this metaphor of an orchestra, which I which I liked. Talk us a bit through that a bit more, and and how you develop that in the book. Yeah, we 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 develop the metaphor, as you said, of of, of the orchestra, and and I think that the the metaphor is interesting because it it um, it acknowledges the fact that in order to successfully transform you need to consider multiple areas across the organizational value chain. You know, traditionally with a digital transformation, you know, you've got marketing, you, you, you've got IT, you know, and maybe someone else. And, and one of the reasons that, that many of these digital transformation projects fail, and there is a huge legacy of failure, is that they're only focused on these silos. And so they ignore other elements of the organizational value chain that are actually extremely important in order to succeed, like how you engage with your employees, you know, how you understand your, your, your customers, how you incentivize people, uh, the culture and mindset within the organization, uh, the channels, the way you reach the market. I mean, all these things become very, very important in achieving a successful transformation. And, and the little secret about digital transformation, really, that we've learned is that it, it's not that much about digital. Digital is often 
It's often the reason that you're transformed because of some kind of disruption. And it often provides a big part of the solution, but it's really more about business transformation. And the orchestra kind of maps out these eight elements across the organization that need to be considered. I think beyond that, you know, the, the orchestra metaphor is interesting. I mean, imagine if you go to an orchestra and, and you listen to one instrument playing, and let's say it's playing beautifully. After a while, it gets a little bit boring. You know, you, you want to hear more. But at the same time, if you go to an orchestra and all the instruments are playing beautifully, but they're playing their own tunes, together it sounds horrible. And that's actually what happens in many transformations. You have each of the each silo, each group, each function, each market, each product category, kind of doing their own thing. And so the transformation as a whole is a mess. So this is the, you know, the, the metaphor of the orchestration, just like an orchestra, you know, you have to, you have to make sure that the different instruments are playing the right pieces at the right time. The only real place where, where the metaphor breaks down is that, is that an orchestra has a pre-written piece of music that they're playing. But in real life, there is no, there is no piece of music. You are building and creating it as you go along, which makes the job of the orchestrator all the more difficult. So kind of a jazz orchestra. <laughs> more like jazz orchestra. than maybe traditional, uh, yeah, classical music, perhaps. Right. Okay. And so I hear that, and I, and I, so, so this is interesting because when I think about what might be a successful approach to change, right? So, so I get that the linear approaches and the Cotter plan-driven style approaches to, to change um, are less effective. Um, and then I tend in my mind to go towards this, this notion that actually the way to affect change is to take a, a friendly pocket of the organization, to have that start to work in different ways, to develop some good stories, and then through a viral effect, start to spread better ways of approaching um, the new challenges a- across the organization. Um, and, and I think you're saying something slightly different, actually. You, you, you don't want to make it entirely bottom up and, and rely entirely on a, on a viral effect. You want to keep some elements of that original big plan Big, sort of big plan style approach. Is, is that right? Have I got that right? You do have that right. I think the uh, the bottom up approach uh, tends to have some advantages, as in, in that it's it's usually driven from a real need somewhere, you know, on the edge of the organization, and that's a good thing. Uh, but the problem is, if you're a, if you're a big organization and, and you take this approach, you end up with tens, hundreds, or or more. Of these of these interesting projects that that individually make a lot of sense, but but as a whole, it just becomes a huge mess. So I think you know a, a mix of sort of the orchestration, top down, vision led, you know, portfolio approach makes a lot of uh, sense, but not to the to, to the point where you're back into the planning mode. So so the, the, there's a little bit of I think a little bit of uh, both, but either extreme. Can lead to uh, can lead to significant problems. You, you imagine if you have this bottom up approach and you have, you know, multiple business lines or business units, you're going to have projects that look very similar that don't know of the other one, and so you have a lot of duplication, uh, which which we see all the time. So at some point, it makes sense to kind of consolidate and and uh, orchestrate those as as you know more of a more of a centrally led. Uh, uh, kind of approach, basically a portfolio. I mean, one of the first things we tell companies to do when they think, you know, into these digital transformations, we, we tell them, well, you're not starting. You've already started. You may not know it, but if, if you actually do an inventory of all the digital projects that are happening in your company, you'll be shocked about how many there are. So the, one of the first steps is just going in and trying to figure out what is, you know, what are all the things that are happening today? And do these things make sense from a kind of a holistic point of view? Right. And you made a distinction in the book between centralized, bottom up, but then this network transformation. Could you expand on that? Yeah, um, it it goes back to the earlier points that uh, that we were making around you know the problem with silos. Uh, often, digital digital objectives or business objectives supported by digital tools and technologies are horizontal in, in, in that they're across the organization. 
Um, so it's it's really important to to understand you know where the relevant resources are to solve your problem and, and meet your objective, and and in most cases they're spread around they're they're, they're they're spread out through different functions through different business units or geographies, so this kind of network approach to I you know identify connect mobilize and enable all these resources is really really important. Uh, if not, you just end up uh, uh, either not being very effective, which is often the case when, when you're taking a siloed approach, or you're just creating another digital silo, uh, which is which is also problematic. So the networked kind of approach, which is very, very difficult, by the way, to do in practice, is probably the most effective way to achieve these, these objectives. Well, and you quote one executive in the book who talks about it's better to do four or five really strategic things taking this orchestrated approach and to do a multitude of bottom-up experiments yeah obviously there's 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 a balance that has to be struck you want to keep some kind of innovative bottom-up um, inductive uh, you know projects because that's sometimes where the real insights come from uh, but yes, uh, that's true. You know, identifying you know the role of a, a chief digital officer or chief transformation officers is is largely to identify these these important projects and try to facilitate them uh, uh, within the business. And most of those projects will have some kind of cross organizational um, uh, objectives. So they're not just sitting within a single silo. If it's within a single silo of an organization, fine, let them do it. Uh, but if it has real cross enterprise opportunities, uh, then it should be kind of taken up and, and, and orchestrated from a, a somewhat of a higher level. You know, for, for example, we, we talked earlier about the oil and gas industry, you know, a, a, a big kind of a movement in that industry is, is to create digital representations of physical things. Uh, they're called digital twins. So a digital twin of a turbine or a pump or, or a whole, you know, uh, 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 distribution channel of, let's say, oil and gas, taking it from the field all the way to a refinery, all the way to a, to a station to, to get a digital representation of that, which is a really, really good idea because suddenly you see where all the issues are. You can do predictive, predictive maintenance. You can drive out inefficiencies uh, and, and all those things. Uh, but in order to do that successfully, I mean, you need to get cooperation from lots and lots of different departments in the organization. They have to work together uh, in ways they haven't had to do so before. So there's a huge coordination challenge that companies face when they're taking this network approach. And we talk about that quite a bit in the book. Right. And... And that's actually, and that's that's a difference. So that is it. So, so while it's still, to some extent, taking a big picture, top down to some level approach, it, it's different from building a big plan, isn't it? It, it? There's something else that people are engaged in here, and it's more focused on connecting resources and them, I suppose, being aligned to a single vision. We we generally advise against setting up a uh, you know a whole new uh, digital business unit. Uh, it has been done uh, sometimes successfully, but many 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 cases not very successfully because you end up creating you know a new silo uh, that becomes quite separate from the business, and and so there could be conflicts there. Uh, which happens in some cases. In other cases, you know, the new unit just kind of ignored, and, and the rest of the business just continues doing what they've always been doing. So I think the the the, the job of the orchestrator is really to is to facilitate and support initiatives that are happening within the business, you know, and help drive and accelerate and improve those 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 efforts, rather than setting up you know parallel structures. Right. Okay. And so, what are the key? So, let's just let's just say uh, there's a listener here, and they're they're either coaching or they've themselves taken on a, a, a transformation role. Or what are the key things they need to focus on themselves to be an effective orchestrator? <laughs> 
This is a really, really uh, tough position. There are quite a few people out there who've been, you know, tapped on the shoulder and, you know, given the responsibility to drive the digital transformation for the company. Uh, you know, great expectations. They're often given uh, nice titles, uh, maybe reporting to a senior executive, sometimes reporting directly to the CEO, uh, and they're told, go, go do it. Um, this is a really, really tough, uh, a, a tough job, and, and many, of, many of them end up being what we call in the book the kings and queens of PowerPoint. Uh, they end up, you know, creating great slides and they, uh, uh, you know, very, very interesting speakers. They go to conferences, they speak on panels and they, and, and they get interviewed by journalists. Uh, but within the company, just nobody cares. Uh, they just have no, they have some kind of, you know, formal role, but they have very little formal authority, small teams, small budgets. And... And so it's extremely difficult for them to go into a business and say, no, 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 you've got to stop doing that and you've got to do it this way. Uh, or I want you to, to change the way you're doing things and make it more digital. It's just really, really hard to do that. So, so, so one of the key skills that these people need to have is, is, is strong persuasion skills, being able to navigate the political walls of power within companies in a very effective way. It also helps if they have a carrot that they can take with them uh, because the stick is really not very effective. And the only stick they have really is that, you know, if you don't cooperate, I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the CEO. And, 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 and that's a threat that you want to be extremely careful to use. So what they've got left really is, is the carrot. And so the most effective chief digital officers and transformation uh, uh, officers are the ones that come with resources that they can use to accelerate projects that they see that they see as valuable. Uh, these resources may be, may be people with particular specific skills. Uh, they may be funds, uh, matching funds for particular projects, and so on. Uh, so really, this, this kind of facilitation orchestration role is, is part technical, but mostly organizational. Right. And you talk about the, the have model for, for leaders in this position. Yeah, that, and that is an interesting piece of work that we did. You know, most of the book and most of the work that we do is, um, is, is, is really, I would say, at the organizational level. Like, you know, what should you do strategically? What should you do tactically? But we realized that, that it's people that have to lead these journeys. And so we asked the question, is there anything new about the decades of, of, of work that's been done on what makes an effective leader? Uh, and so we went, we went out and, and we tried to figure out, are there certain competencies that differentiate successful from less successful leaders? And what we found was very interesting. We, uh, many of the things that are traditionally associated with strong leadership still apply. You know, leaders, you know, should be good communicators. They should have integrity. They should be resilient and so forth. But we also found some, some relatively new and, and, and different attributes of successful leaders, which differentiated the successful from the less successful ones. And there were four of them in particular that stood out. Uh, the first one we call uh, uh, humility. Uh, and it's actually around, around learning and knowledge and expertise. You know, the traditional view of a leader is that, you know, is the person with the answer, that the person who knows, you know, where do you go to find the answer? Well, go to the leader. The, the leader knows. The leader is the most knowledgeable person. Uh, but in a fast-changing environment, this is just simply not possible that the leader is going to know the answer. So this idea of humility and learning was very, very important in these successful leaders. They were, they were comfortable in admitting that they don't actually have the answer and they're willing to go and find the answer. So it's a certain amount of confidence that you need to have as a leader to, to admit, I, I, I don't know. I, I really, this is the first thing Tyra has seen this. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to go out and find out what it is. So humility was the first one. The second one uh, was adaptability. Now, we've known for a long time that leaders have to be adaptable. But in fact, in many cases, the traditional view of a strong leader is somebody, you know, weighs the pluses and the minuses, looks at all the facts and figures, and then, and then makes a decision and then, and then sticks to her guns. You know, she, she's made the decision. She's going to stick to it. Now, now we go. Now we execute. But in a constantly changing world, you could very easily have a situation where you do the analysis on a Monday and the right decision is X. 
But then something happens on Wednesday so that when you revisit the decision on a Thursday, X doesn't make sense anymore. Now we should do Y. So leaders that are, that are willing and comfortable in admitting that, you know, what I said yesterday, the other day is, is no longer valid. Now I'm saying this, this adaptability was also extremely important. Uh, of course, nobody wants a leader who flip flops. So it's not, it's not like leaders change their mind every day, but when situations change, it's okay to change your mind. The third one is uh, vision, a strong vision. We talked about this earlier, that the clarity of vision, you don't necessarily need to know how to get there. That's less important, but a very clear idea of where you're going. And in a, in a world that's changing constantly, it's very easy to get caught up in the change and just and, and, and end up kind of moving quickly, but, but in, in, a, in, in you know, a, a directionless way. So having that clear vision and articulating and communicating and inspiring people around that vision is, 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 seems to be extremely important. And the final one, the last one is what we call engaged. This is the, the kind of the ability of the leader, you know, to avoid just telling and, 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 and spend a lot of time listening listening and communicating, really trying to understand, engage with different stakeholders, understand what's going on, and sense the changes that are happening in the environment. Uh, and the nice thing about digital is that, you know, at one time you had to go out and you had to go to cocktail parties and you had to kiss babies and all those things. Uh, but these days you can be quite engaged uh, purely through digital means, right? Through uh, communicating with stakeholders, wh whether it's customers or employees, uh, through, you know, social media, for example, or, or, or other formats. But this, this engagement, high engagement, uh, was really important. So if we summarize that there, there's a four elements, there's the humility, machine learning, there's adaptability, the, the, the vision, the, the sense of a clear vision, and engagement. That was yeah. a long answer to the question. Yeah, no, but I like it, and I love the fact that you've included engagement, because... The last guest on the show, Nikki Gatton, who runs a, a marketing agency here in the UK, um, and she's just written a book called Super Engaged, and she's been, which has been nominated Business Book of the Year. But she she talks about the, the benefits that come from, and they have an extremely engaged culture, right? To the extent where they will interview their employees uh, about their dreams, they call them dream consultations, and they seek to find ways to incorporate their employees' dreams, whatever they might be in the business plans and the, and the innovations and the, and the experiments of the company itself. But it's a sort of take, and they had the people who surveyed her culture had to create a new category when they surveyed this company and called it super engaged. for these, these people who felt like they were leading their best lives within, within the company and hence the name of the book. But I think that's such an important part of change and transformation is that ability to harness the, the engagement, the creativity uh, of of the people that you're working with, so it, it makes complete sense that you've in, you've included that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So I know that you've spoken to a lot of executives through the course of preparing for this book and, and in your role as um, within IMD. What What are the stories that have really inspired you from the leaders you've met, or is there one in particular? Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, have I been inspired by any particular leaders? Um, there are a few, I think, that what inspires me is, is, is when a leader, you know, is put in a, in a very traditional company or a very traditional role and, 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 and takes a kind of a, a contrarian approach and tries to, and tries to drive a transformation in a very kind of new and innovative Way. You know, of course, I'm inspired by leaders of digital giants, but 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 in some way, you know, they're uh, they're operating a culture which supports their values. But it's not always the case when when leaders come into very traditional companies and have to have to deal with you know cultures that are not necessarily open or willing to embrace or accept new ways of doing things. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm inspired by, 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 by leaders who, who do that. You know, I think in terms of uh, 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 the, the now chairman used to be the CEO of Lego, the, the Lego group, uh, Jürgen V. Uh, Knustorp. I mean, he, he really came in with a new mindset and he, he really pushed the organization to, to, to change. So it was not just a financial 
transformation. It was a cultural transformation. Uh, uh, we see, you know, new leaders in in, uh, in in organizations all over the place trying to do this now. You know, in, in Switzerland, we have a, we have a, quite a few new executives. We have, uh, you know, Nestle's got a new executive who's really trying to to change the the, the culture there and transform that organization. Uh, we see it in a number of banks. You know, some some some, some great cases in in, in the Nordics. Uh, I like I liked what um, Carolyn McCall did with EasyJet, and I was trying to do with ITV. You know, the, these the, the, these are people who are, who who are trying to come in and, and and in many ways shake up a very very traditional culture. Uh, that's you know that's 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 really inspiring. Right, and, and are any of those um, individuals that? Because I know you highlight you, you talk about Lego in the book, but is there a particular story that for you encapsulates a lot of what you're talking about in terms of how a leader has changed an organization, transformed an organization? Um, I mean, the, the, it, I think the example that we use in the book, we, we open and close the book uh, with, with with the case of a of a traditional business leader who was kind of thrown into the role of a chief digital officer. And like I mentioned before, given the task of transforming, you know, a very traditional oil and gas field services company. And, and you know, what she's had to do to, to kind of um, drive that transformation in, in, in that company has been really, really interesting. But it's also interesting to see how she's also transformed as a leader. Mm. You know, her... Uh, because you know, this oil and gas industry is project based. You know, the, the whole thing is, is 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 you get a project, you know, and and you drive it, and then you then you you deliver it. And this is her mindset. So when she went into this role, one of the biggest challenges that that, that she had was just accepting the fact that success was not clearly defined. I mean, this is a very difficult thing for many for many managers and leaders to accept that. You don't all necessarily know what success looks like. You have to define it, and that and that has to, you know, that has that's a moving target. It changes over time. So the 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 um, this kind of mindset shift from from uh, transformation being something that you start, you transform, you finish, and then you you know, then you need is business as usual uh, to something that transformation is a continual process that never stops. Is really really tricky uh, to for, for many of these executives to internalize and operate in, and this was the this was the case with this uh, this chief digital officer. I mean, she, she's she's now very much trans she's transformed the company, but she's also gone through a personal transformation, and that's interesting to watch. Right, letting go of the sense of certainty. There is no certainty anymore, you know, and, and unless you're unless you're at the very, very tactical end. Um, you know, I challenge you to tell me any industry where you where you can be sure what it what it's going to be like in three years. We just don't know. There's no industry now where we can be with any level of concrete certainty what the dynamics of that industry is going to be like in three years. And yet we see companies all over the world running three year plans. Where do they think they're going to they're going to go? I can tell you one thing for sure, where they're going to end up after three years, where they thought they should be three years ago, is not going to be the place they want to be. Hmm. Right. And I suppose that comes back to your, to your model that they have, the age of they have, having that humility to uh, embrace this uncertainty. Well, that, that's the individual side, but then they, you know, they have to convince the rest of the organization uh, as well. And many organizations are actually... Uh, optimally built and developed uh, to exist in a world that doesn't change very often. And that's, that, that's, that's tricky to get a hand around, handle around. Right. So even if you've done your own work to get to a place where you embrace it, it's like, how do I then operate within a culture? I mean, this is the main reason why many of these traditional companies are, are struggling to compete with, you know, the digital giants. Like like Amazon and you know players like that because they just can't shift and adapt fast enough. Right. Yeah, I, I read a book recently that talking about how multiple changes to the Amazon website per second. I think. I mean that. 
Yeah. You know, and, and, and these changes, they're, they're not permanent changes, right? I mean, they're all experiments. So they're all testing. They're, they're continually testing and adapting. So if, if you can, if you can, and this is a, this is a very, I think an interesting insight, but very, very, very tough to put into practice. If you can adjust fast enough, you can basically always be where you want to be or should be, depending on the dynamics of the market. You do not need any strategy or any planning. You can completely give up planning and strategy because you're always where exactly where you want to be. Planning and strategy is really just giving you a kind of a direction, a line to follow, uh, because you're making your best guess about what the future is going to be like. But if you always know exactly where you want to be, you don't need that plan. Now, that's an extreme case. I'm not, I'm not recommending companies completely give up planning, but you know, that's maybe an interesting endpoint. Right, right. That may, may, may be where we where we go. Mm. Well, I think I think. I mean, what's interesting about uh, our personal lives is the way that we conduct ourselves outside of business. We we tend not to create intricate, elaborate plans for lots of the things that we do together with people. It's almost like there's this cult of planning that's emerged in business that doesn't just just feels a bit anachronistically in a sense and that but we somehow we can't we can't let go of it true um that is true and i think i think i think it's it's shifting um okay i know that we've got we've we've not got much time left with you until you get to you get to your next meeting so something we like to ask a lot of our guests here and we do tend to focus on on the individual is um and it's the name of the show but for you michael what does it mean to be human <laughs> Well, this is a philosophical question. Uh, what does it mean to be human? Um, what does it mean to be human? I, I, I think probably for me, uh, what it means to be human is to have freedom of choice uh, so that I can freely choose. It's probably an illusion of choice, but at least if I, if, if I feel that I can choose what I want to do, how I want to spend my time, uh, then, then that's the essence of, of of what it means to be human. And I'm really comparing to you know the digital world where where you know most most elements of the digital world, most systems and tools, they don't, they don't have choice. I mean, they just do what they're told to do. They do it extremely well, uh, but they don't have any any free choice. So I think still today, at least for the near future, we still have that. Whether we'll have it. Uh, Forever, I'm, I'm not so sure. But being human means having the freedom to choose what you want to do, how you want to do it, to me. Well, great. Thank you. That's, no, that's, that's, that's a fantastic answer. And thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, so in terms of people who want to learn more about orchestrating transformation, there's, there's a book it's out. Net, well, this, we're now February, right? So it's out pretty soon, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's out. I actually got the uh, the proofs of the book. It looks like this uh, uh, today. So so uh, it's in print. It will be out. Uh, we're aiming for the the third week of uh, February. Third week of February. And I would also recommend people because you the one chapter of the book you summarise what you covered in digital walk text in terms of the different strategies if you're being disrupted by a by a digital player and I, I really enjoyed that I know we haven't we haven't gone there in this interview so I'd thoroughly recommend people to read both books actually if you're not aware of digital vortex um, we'll put all the links uh, in the show description uh, but once again thank, thank you for your time uh, my pleasure Richard pleasure. thank you for thank you for the time uh, uh, and for everyone out there you know uh, best of luck with the transformation uh, I'm not sure we have all the answers I, I, I think we have a window into the world it's not easy but there are cases of companies that have successfully transformed so you can too brilliant thank you all right thanks Michael my pleasure <laughs>